want to thank everybody for being here today. We've had a, a briefing to discuss an extraordinarily cold, cold weather system uh, that will be sweeping across uh, the entire state of Texas. Uh, there will be ultra cold temperatures, and we need to make sure that everybody in the state of Texas is, is aware of what's coming, but also uh, aware of, of two primary issues that I want to focus on. The first thing is uh, we want to make it through this episode uh, protecting the life of every Texan. And there are several ways we go about that. One is to uh, ensure that every Texan is aware of what they can do for themselves to make sure that they do not expose themselves to cold temperature in a way that would cause them to lose their lives. Point being, when we get to the time periods that are going to be the coldest, the recommendation would be, if at all possible, for you to stay uh, in your home or other locations so you're not going outside exposing yourself to that cold temperature. Uh, there will be additional information provided by Chief Nim Kidd that will be discussing warming centers uh, in regions across the state of Texas in the event that anybody needs access to a location to keep themselves warm. The second thing we want to emphasize, because I know a lot of people are concerned, is the power going to stay on? And as we will explain in detail, uh, we feel very good uh, about uh, the status of the Texas power grid and ERCOT to, to be able to uh, effectively and successfully uh, ensure that the power is going to stay on throughout the entirety of this winter storm episode. A couple of key things I want to cover, then I will pass it on to others to talk about. Uh, one is uh, that uh, there's going to be a lot of cold weather coming in uh, beginning on uh, Saturday through Wednesday. And you'll just see it moving in from the north and going all the way to South Texas. And so for uh, th those several days, uh, beginning on Saturday, depending upon where you are, uh, and then Saturday night, uh, Sunday, all the way through Wednesday. You just need to be well prepared for a multi-day long period of being surrounded by extraordinarily cold weather. One thing that is less predictable, but based upon current predictions, is in our favor and that is there's not a lot of precipitation that is expected to take place in the state of Texas during the storm. Now there are certain areas based upon certain models uh, that show that uh, for uh, one or two days there, there could be some precipitation in central and in east Texas, but there's just no high level of probability at this time uh, that that's going to take place. If it does, obviously, uh, there are extra precautions that need to be taken. Anybody who gets out on the road and drives in an area this cold uh, that has any precipitation on it needs to understand that it's a very dangerous situation. If you do not need to be on the road, don't go on the road uh, for a day or two. That's a, a way that you yourself can ensure that you're protecting your life. Everyone knows that if you're driving on icy roads, sometimes it's difficult to really see with your own eyes that there's ice on the road until you hit your brakes and you lose control of the vehicle. And so just be very, very cautious because part of the precipitation coming down would be in the form of ice and can turn into black ice, uh, which is impossible to see. I cannot overemphasize if you do not need to be driving don't do so. Second, when precipitation comes down, it can weigh on trees uh, and other objects uh, that because of the weight on trees and tree limbs, it can bring, they, they can fall and hit power lines. Uh, and as Pablo Vegas will uh, tell you more about here shortly, uh, we want to make sure every Texan is fully informed about what to do in the event that a power line falls. Because in the state of Texas, there are several participants in the process of providing you power. 
One is the ERCOT power grid. And once again, we believe that the power grid ERCOT is going to be able to ensure that power is available through the entirety of this winter storm. There are chances, depending upon where you live, that power lines that deliver the power to your home could go down. That is an issue for your local power company. Pablo Vegas is going to explain to you ways in which you can quickly contact your power company uh, to make sure that they are uh, involved in the process of getting your power back going again. I can tell you this, and that is those local power providers, they, they understand about the challenges they will be dealing with, and they are uh, making the preparations necessary that they have the staffing involved to rush uh, getting power lines back up again. Um, there are, when you look at the depths of the cold temperature and uh, when you uh, look at uh, power demand and when you factor in time periods when there's going to be a lower supply of wind available for the power grid, there's going to be two time periods uh, when it's going to be a little bit closer uh, on power availability. Those two time periods will be Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning. Right now, based upon the briefing that we just had, uh, ERCOT explained that we, we should have sufficient power to make it through that time period. I just want to do everything possible to be transparent to all Texans just to know that as we sit here on Friday, knowing things can change in the next few days, we are expecting Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning uh, to be the tightest times for the ERCOT power grid. Uh, know this, and, and that is uh, power generators are uh, fully uh, inspected uh, and prepared and winterized uh, for this process. They have never been as prepared for a winter event as they are today, including have a, having a secondary source of fuel available to make sure that they will not lose access to fuel uh, to fuel the power generation that's needed uh, to send throughout the entire grid to make sure that you're going to be able to heat your home. Uh, and with that, I am going to at this time uh, pass it over to uh, Pablo Vegas, uh, the head of the ERCOT power grid system in the state of Texas. Thank you very much, Governor Abbott. So I want to start by saying that ERCOT, we're very close to monitoring all of the weather conditions as it relates to this weather event, um, and we are prepared to deal with this event. The, uh, this cold weather front that's moving into Texas is not just only affecting the ERCOT grid, it is also affecting grids across the nation, so this is going to be a nationwide cold weather event. We're going to be coordinating very closely across the industry to make sure that we work to support each other as the coldest periods uh, occur. And this includes areas across Texas that are not covered by the ERCOT power grid. So if you think about East Texas, that's covered by Entergy, up in the Panhandle where we have SWEPCO and TNMP, and in West Texas where we have El Paso. Those are not part of the ERCOT grid, but we'll be working closely with those uh, grid operators and utility companies to make sure that we do everything we can to try to ensure power stays on consistently. At, as the governor noted, at this point we do expect the uh, ERCOT grid to be normal conditions throughout this weather event. Uh, there's not an expectation of an energy emergency, and we are not calling for conservation at this point in time. Now things can change, and if it does change, we'll continue to communicate openly over the course of this weekend if those conditions do change and we do need conservation. We're not calling for conservation now. We've issued a weather watch to cover this event. That's because we do expect uh, conditions to be very cold and the demand to be very high. So we've got a weather watch in place and we'll be continuing to update that throughout the course of this event. You can go to our website, ERCOT.com, to get information about the weather. You can also use our mobile app. Our mobile app will have information about that too. I want to let you know and reassure you that we are using every tool in our toolbox to make sure that the grid is going to be absolutely ready and prepared to deliver energy to all Texans throughout this weather event. The grid is better prepared than it has ever been before, in particular as it relates to cold weather events like this that, are, that is approaching. Whenever you have a winter weather event like this, there's always a possibility that you could get ice on lines or high winds that could cause localized outages, as the governor mentioned. 
there, in those cases, that's the local utility company's responsibility to deal with that. So we encourage folks that have power outages to contact either their local utility and go to their website if they want to get information, or you can go to the PUCTexas.gov slash storm site, which is right up here. This will have information on how to access your local uh, utility information and also have information about outages as well. We're going to add this link to the ERCOT site, so it's very simple for folks to find. If they don't remember this, if they come to ERCOT because they want to check what's going on, they'll be able to see this as well to get access to that. I want to emphasize a few things that we're doing around winter preparedness to make sure that we're going to be getting through this without any problems. First off, the weatherization inspections. We've completed uh, nearly 1,800 weatherization inspections across power generation and transmission facilities over the last couple of years. We're on track to do 450 this winter alone in order to ensure that everybody is weatherized and prepared to get through this weather event. We have been working with generators as well as transmission operators to schedule the maintenance on their system in between the very hot summer that we completed this summer all the way to this winter event. They've been taking their outages and doing maintenance on their power facilities to make sure that they're ready to perform during a, a tight weather event like this. And the, the fleet looks like it's in good condition. In addition, the fuel supplies look solid across the board from coal piles to the gas supply. We expect there to be adequate fuel to meet the needs of Texans throughout this entire event as well, so fuel shouldn't be an issue. And I want to, again, reinforce, we're using every tool in our toolbox, the conservative operations, making sure we bring on units earlier if we need to in order to make sure we've got enough power to meet demand. We're going to be using all of those techniques throughout this weather event. So with that, I urge all Texans to stay safe during this cold winter event, and I'll turn it over to Chairwoman Craddock to talk a little bit about what's going on at the Railroad Commission. Thank you, Pablo. So first and foremost, we are the natural gas group and I want to say lines are packed and we have more storage available and full than we ever have before. We too at the Railroad Commission have done a lot, about 1,400 inspections since and finished our Tier 1 inspections by the end of December, so our people are ready to go as well, and we've sent out notices to operators to remind them of the storm so they are ready to go as well. Look, gas is flowing to our local distribution companies, which is obviously the gas going into your home and to your businesses. Again, if there's an outage there, which we don't anticipate, you're to call your local company for that. But we anticipate your gas is going to flow to keep your home warm. We have been consistently meeting with our regulated industries. In fact, we have a call regularly, and our next one's at 2 o'clock if there are any issues. But we haven't seen any. We are seeing everybody ready to go. Uh, CNG trucks are pre-positioned as a precaution across the state in case there is a natural gas issues. Um, we're obviously in contact with all the other agencies that you see sitting here, as well as, I will say, the PUC, the Railroad Commission, and our Cotter have great communication, I think, and I appreciate our partners. And the last thing I want to remind people, and I know that Nim will talk about this as well, safety is really important, not just don't get on the roads, but also if you're using natural gas, make sure if you smell gas to call and for safety, don't put a propane tank in the middle of your house. Be sure you are smart about using gas. This is a this is a safety issue for all of us. So we uh, we appreciate the, the fact that our natural gas is going to flow across the state, and we've got plenty of it. So we think we'll, we'll have a good winter storm this cycle. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and now Chief of the Texas Division of Emergency Management, Nim Kidd. Thank you, Governor. You know, life safety is our number one priority for first responders across the state. Our second priority is going to be the protection of property. And in doing that, we really need to talk about people, pipes, pets, and plants. As we talk about people, you'll see the map of the warming centers. These 152 locations across the state right now are opened and operated by our local government partners. In each of these major cities and the website, you can go to that local government and they will tell you when it is open and closed. But to start with, Texans can go to tdem.texas.gov slash warm. It's the first click on the home page. That will also take you from warming centers to a place where many of our communities across Texas are going to be below freezing for 80 to 90 hours. And in some challenges, that can uh, cause a problem for pipes. So on our website also, you have a list of all of the licensed plumbers in the state of Texas. I'm urging all Texans to take this afternoon, today, to start preparing to protect their homes and their businesses, and in doing so, we have these resources available to you. As the chairwoman said, carbon monoxide poisonings always happen 
during these type of cold weather events. And I need your help in getting this message out because these are preventable injuries and deaths. You should never run a generator inside your home. You should never run your car inside your garage with the garage door closed. And if you're going to have gas or, or wood burning appliances inside the house, make sure that you have ventilation. There's no reason for people to stay cold in their home with all of the warming centers that we have across the state. So we feel that we're really well prepared for this. Last thing is, it's always a good time to check your emergency supplies. Take the data stock up to make sure you have your normal supply of bottled water, to make sure you have plenty of food in the house. We believe that everything is going to go smoothly from a, a power generation and distribution side, but one person in a car wreck can take out a power pole that takes out a power line. And in these cold conditions, to be below freezing for so many hours, to get that power back on at the local level could take a lot longer than any of us want. So what we want you to do is make sure the Texans are prepared. And finally, we're already talking uh, to some of our school district superintendents that are talking about closures on Tuesday. So we want to make sure that parents are checking with their school districts to make sure that if schools are closed on Tuesday, they have a plan for the kids for those days. Again, life safety is our number one priority, and then property protection is our second priority. And Governor, with that, remarks. Thank you. I want to em emphasize one last thing that uh, Chief Kidd made reference to, and, and that is because of the ultra-cold temperatures for such a prolonged period of time in certain areas, there's going to be certain areas uh, where there's a much greater risk of having problems with your pipes. Uh, the best time to take action to prevent your pipes from eventually bursting uh, would be today or tomorrow. Uh, so take swift action to be prepared uh, for several days of ultra-cold weather. Well, that will take a few questions. Governor, I wanted to ask you um, about some of the long-term investments that the legislature made and you signed into law with SB6, SB7, making investments to build new power plants. What, what's the timeline there? When do we expect to see those investments uh, fully come to fruition, and, and when could all of those plants come onto the grid? So, and I'll answer the question uh, followed by Pablo, who has a little bit more detailed information. But uh, for one, um, even before the laws that I signed in the aftermath of this last session that provides economic incentives uh, for more power generation in the state of Texas, uh, we had more power coming onto the grid. Over this, uh, over 2023 and in 2024, uh, there have been many announcements of more power coming onto the grid. Uh, Pablo and I did, did one in Houston, Texas, uh, with Calpine in December. There were some announcements b before that. Uh, and uh, you also see uh, a massive increase uh, in battery uh, power generation already, but also forthcoming for the remainder of this year. There are literally dozens, if uh, not scores, of uh, projects uh, in the early stages of announcement uh, of adding more power to the grid. So we see great promise uh, in more power generation coming to the state of Texas, and that's going to be especially true uh, because of the law that I signed providing those economic incentives that drives down the cost uh, of providing that additional power. You want to add to that? Yeah, um, it's Texas create provides an outstanding economic environment for investment in power generation. The demand and the economy is growing in the state. That is very clear. We are starting to see a lot of the power generators evaluate projects that they have been uh, working on to advance them more quickly. It can take, on average, you know, three, four years to build a power plant on average. <coughs> but during that time that uh, those power plants are constructed and built, we expect to see in rapid increases in the availability of battery storage, probably doubling the amount of battery storage in the state of Texas uh, this year alone, and seeing continued growth in 25, 26, and 27. Um, in addition to, of course, we've seen a lot of growth uh, on the renewable fleet as well. Solar growth is continuing very rapidly, which is great in the summer when we need that to cover the, the big peaks in the summer. But the environment in Texas is strong for investment, and we're seeing the, motion, the movement on that that's well supported by the legislation that was passed. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, you talked a bit about the thermal fleet. Can you talk about projections for wind and solar during this event? Yeah, <clears throat> because the, this is not a heavy precipitation uh, 
uh, weather event. We expect the wind performance to remain strong throughout the next several days. Um, as the governor pointed out, Tuesday into Tuesday night, that's where we see a little ebbing in the wind, but it's not any issue with uh, with freezing that we expect. We expect it more just to be traditional kind of wind flows. And then on the solar front, it's cloudy on Monday is what we're forecasting, uh, but good uh, performance on Tuesday and Wednesday, so we expect to have so strong solar performance those days. So we do expect the renewable fleet to be a, a co core component of delivering power throughout this event. Governor Abbott, I know that we're here to talk about the weather event. Respectfully, there's another story that's getting a lot of attention, which is what's going down at the southern border. The federal government has alleged that the Texas National Guard is blocking access to a crucial part of the border. What's your reaction to that, and did that come down from the state leaders? Yeah, very happy to answer the question, uh, and I will. Uh, but uh, because of the magnitude of the storm, let me take other questions first, and I'll come back to you. I'm sorry if I missed it, but is TxDOT doing, is there a need for any road preps or anything like that? Uh, you did not miss it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad you asked it. Uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, TxDOT is engaged already uh, in making sure that, that roads are going to be prepared across the entire state of Texas. As I mentioned earlier, there's a greater chance of precipitation in central and east Texas. Uh, and, and that's where uh, the primary focus is right now. But also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's not clarity about exactly where we will have precipitation. And so there's going to be great flexibility by TxDOT in every region of the state of Texas uh, to make sure they are treating, treating roads uh, in a way to prepare them for potential travel over roads that are, that are icy, that have snow or other uh, aspects to it that make it dangerous for people to drive. TxDOT's primary focus is public safety right now on our roadways. Commissioner Craddock mentioned uh, natural gas supplies to homes and businesses. What about motor fuels? Are, there, are you uh, confident that the uh, stations around the uh, state will have adequate uh, gas and diesel supplies? While we don't do that directly, yes, we don't We don't anticipate a problem. Everybody's staged and ready to go, and, and we should have plenty of fuel in the, in the state. Thank you. Um, uh, your press release on January 7th mentioned that part of level two readiness was having volunteer organizations be mobilized. Could you talk more about what that entails, what, what these volunteers do? Yes, ma'am, great question. And a lot of that has to do with our warming centers and locations. So across cities, where they will open up with either city employees or volunteer or faith-based organizations to help staff those warming centers. So our, our VOADs, our volunteer organizations active in disaster, are fully engaged with our local partners and most of the people you see sitting on this first table here behind us in this room are coordinating with them all over the state. Are there any resources that looking at the warming stations for folks who are maybe more um, in the outskirts and the rural parts of the state who are looking for um, warming centers or other places um, to shelter during Yeah, the great question. And as you start drilling down on this map, you'll see a little bit more. Uh, right now, the urban areas are the ones that are primarily focused on it, but this map is a live map. So as those locals open one up, it'll be populated in those areas. Yes, ma'am. You know, if I could em emphasize, um, there's certain core pieces of information that the public needs to know. Uh, and the more that, that you and others uh, can publish, uh, information where people can do one click and go find where a warming center is, that would be fantastic and very helpful. Right there. tdm.texas.gov slash warm. <laughs> Works on your mobile device as well as on the computer. In comparison to some of the winter storms we've had in the past couple of years, I mean, how serious is this one looking to be? I think oftentimes people think with severe weather warnings, oh, I'll be fine, you know, so... What's your message to Texans about the severity of this one in particular? It, it, it is, this is a, a basically a polar vortex uh, that's descending upon Texas. Uh, there's a, a, one of the coldest uh, episodes we'll have been through. It's different than Winter Storm Uri in two ways. Uh, one is that it will not last as long as Winter Storm Uri. Also in Winter Storm Uri, there were times when almost, if not the entirety, of the state of Texas was under cloud cover, uh, and it made it more difficult for all of the power fleet uh, to be operational. Uh, and so uh, pe what people should expect is this, and, and that is th this will be one of the coldest episodes uh, they will have uh, lived through in the state of Texas. Uh, it will last for several days, uh, but it will not be the, the anything close to what we experienced during Winter Storm Uri. 
then I could emphasize we're, we're much, much more prepared uh, for this than we were for Winter Storm Uri. And, and Governor, if Go I ahead, can add, please. those, those that, that may have to work outside, this is dangerous cold. Right. I mean, you look at the Panhandle all the way down into to Midland, Abilene, uh, cross over to the Waco area, it can be 80 to 90 hours of below freezing. It's not getting above freezing. You're going to have, as this front comes in, the wind chills are going to bring down, and then the wind chills won't be as, as devastating. But anything that is left outside or going to be outside will freeze. And I think that's unusual for a lot of Texans. Governor, when you get to Michael's question, could you also uh, <laughs> address the um, remark you made about shooting illegal aliens? Sure. Especially given the mental health uh, uh, components yeah. you guys have talked well yeah. about. We'll, we'll get there. Okay. Up questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have time for those two questions. All right. Uh, so uh, first, with regard to what's going on, I think you're talking about what's going on in Eagle Pass, right? Yeah. So uh, Texas has uh, the legal authority uh, to, to control ingress and egress into any geographic location in the state of Texas, uh, and that authority is being asserted uh, with regard to that park in Eagle Pass, Texas, uh, to maintain operational control of it. Uh, with regard to your question, listen. I was asked a question uh, to legally distinguish between what Texas has the legal authority to do and what would be illegal to do. And I explained in detail uh, all the different things that Texas is doing that we have the legal authority to do and pointed out uh, what would be illegal to do. It's that simple. So you were not making a tongue remark uh, that someone like the El Paso could Absolutely not. Yeah, and uh, I, just, I was asked to, to point out where the line is drawn about what would be illegal, and I, I pointed out something that is obviously illegal. All right, thanks. Thank you.